Well, this morning we are going to enter into the book of 2 Samuel and the continuation of David's life, yeah, who is now king uh, over uh, Judah. And um, I guess he hasn't quite been anointed king over Judah yet, but uh, we ended the, the book of 1 Samuel with the death of Saul and his sons, uh, Jonathan, of course, um, not all their descendants. So Naomi's prayer kind of reminded me of certain thoughts and perspectives. And, you know, my, our objective in this, this study through the scriptures is not to simply gain knowledge of the scriptures and events and happenings and names and places and things that God did. You know, those are, that's knowledge and it's not knowledge that's negative. Uh, it's not uh, a knowledge that is uh, even unnecessary. Um, but I want us to be very mindful of how we view the scriptures. It is very easy to view the scriptures as, you know, even if we believe, you know, these are uh, these, these were real historical events, people, times, places, circumstances, uh, even miracles and, and signs and wonders that actually happened. That's great. They are. That's true. But I think that there is a danger if we ever think to ourselves or take the perspective that, that's, that it's not about a statement, so it's not like you say certain words. But I so think about the way that you think, <laughs> and not necessarily the things that you do or say. This is this book is not. It is and it's not. But I, I, what I'm talking about is perspective here. So hear me out for a minute, and I'll try and explain myself. Especially as it relates to why we would spend time in the scriptures. Why we would take time, why we should continually take time to study and meditate on the words that are written here. And I would submit to you that it's not just to have an idea of what God did. God did this, God did that. That, uh, many times produces a presumptive, presumptuous, assuming way of viewing God and understanding the ways of God. God did this, God did that with this person, in this circumstance, in that situation. And so we begin to develop a, an idea of who God is and what he does. So we say, therefore, God does this and he does that and then we apply that to our life now that may all sound well what's wrong with that and i'm not pointing out a, a a wrong per se because there are principles spiritually speaking that are unchangeable and foundations of spiritual life but there's another way to describe this and it is what is god doing See, there's a difference between what God has done and our presumptions about and our maybe correct or incorrect understandings of why God did what he did in the way that he did. But most of the time when we have a view of the scriptures that sets in the back of the mind and says, well, that's what God did, then the, the implication is, you know, that's a historical event and it's not really applicable and even when it is, then I get to decide how that applies to my life now and to the character, nature of God. So that's what why we would say, therefore God does this. And typically, that does, God does this, has a way of supporting our own ways of thinking. Now, something else I want to just bring as a context into what I'm trying to explain at this moment is time. See, God did 
re directly refers to a historical timeline. And there is, that is, there is, let me say, rather than using the word reality, let me talk about it as a realm of time. Okay? That is linear. Uh, events can be placed on it in order. There's a beginning and an end. And so we also have our own place in that linear timeline. Now, be patient with me. I'm not trying to be philosophical or mystical or whatever, but I want us to have a different understanding if we do not have this understanding, especially as it pertains to the things of God and when we study the Scripture. It's extremely important. This is a very, very valuable point. If we look at what God is doing, then we need to be able to step away from the linear timeline and observe the eternal work of God, which is the very approach that we're taking to the scriptures. What is the eternal purpose of God threaded through this timeline, through the lives of these people and these events? And we will see that God's purpose, what he is doing, was both active then and now. And so understanding the purpose of God, the eternal purpose of God, is what will bring a fundamental understanding of the scriptures and context for the lives of those who we observe and are described. I don't think that I'm even for my own self explaining this very well. But something triggered it in the spirit to be mindful of how we perceive the scriptures. These are not truths, uh, old truths in a historical sense as if they don't really count that much anymore. We're not doing a Bible lesson in the same way that you go to school and take a history or a math or a science lesson and walk away with some extra additional knowledge of historical events. Here's the thing. That is not even the way that you should study history. History is an extremely important subject, educationally. Now, I know that when I was going through school, I didn't like history that much because to me, it was a bunch of times and dates that I could never remember right. The value of history is to learn from it, not learn about it. So, yes, we should learn from history and not just about it. Not just a series of events where God did this, God did that, and we learn something about his miraculous powers and ways, and we become enthralled with this God because he's a powerful God. Our God is not like that. Our God is not like the other gods that are not true gods, that are idols worshipped, that are other angelic entities worshipped. Our God has a purpose, a plan that he would see fulfilled. And it's an eternal one. It wasn't just with Israel. So the work that God has done in the midst of those lives of w that we have observed to this point, the patriarchs, the Israelites, and now getting into some individuals' lives, like we did with Ruth, Samuel, David now, they represent something that directly correlates and parallels to the purpose of God, that are spiritually, the purposes are spiritually alive and active and relevant now, in this moment, today, in your life.
They're alive. God's purpose is alive now. Now, one of the values that we have in looking historically back as God was revealing this purpose in the lives of the people, through the mouths of the prophets, through their circumstances, is we do. We learn how it was developed, but more importantly, we learn the heart of God. David's life, as we continue in 2 Samuel, is something that was, it's very weighty. There's a lot here in terms of a understanding of the life of a son and also of kingship in the authority and rule of God's kingdom. His life was messianic in many ways. It was representative, symbolic of Christ. And if it is that, then it is also representative and symbolic of the church. There are also, we will see as we go through the first few chapters of this book, ways of life that are represented. A wisdom a difference in the wisdom that was applied to the lives of those here. The primary uh, comparison will be of that between the house of Saul and the house of David. Two different wisdoms that governed, ruled over the, 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 the people of God, Israel. So these, not just the events, again, it, it would never be about whether you could go to someone and, and uh, reverse the, the events that happened in David's life. What did David go through? Why did he go through it? To what end? For what purpose? What did he learn? How does that, how did it affect and change him as a person? How did it develop him as a king? What was the culture difference between his life and his rule and that of Saul and even the other kings? I take a moment to describe this, not in much detail, but I do want to mention that this is something David's reign in particular that will be compared to over all the books that relate to the kings. So 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles. Every life of a king is compared to whether or not they walked in the same way of righteousness, honor, respect, reverence in the way that David did. And it will either say, and this king, so-and-so, was either like David or he was not. He did not follow in those ways. We see a similar principle applied in with, uh, with Samuel Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 8 said this, Samuel grew old, he appointed his sons as judges for Israel, rulers over Israel. The name of his firstborn was Joel and the second Abijah, and they served at Beersheba. But his sons did not walk in his ways. In the same way, the kings of Israel that followed David will always be compared to his ways specifically in relation to their obedience to God, but not just in obedience to a set of rules that God put forth. 
but a perspective and a way of life. So there's a lot of scripture that was produced from the life of David, not only as an account of his life, but by his own hand, especially between he and Solomon. And then many of the prophets and the apostles wrote of him in the same way that they would write about the history and context of Israel and God's work in their midst. So we should always ask ourselves, why is there so much focus, like as we have with Israel, why is there so much focus on coming out of Egypt in the wilderness, all through the scriptures? Why is there so much focus on this man, David, in his rule? In his writings, there's a reason. It represents something spiritually. And that spiritual representation does not undermine in any way what that man, those people went through in the time that they lived. But there's a greater reality. And that's where we exit the the realm of time into another realm that has no time, no beginning and no end. Because that's where the work of God is always active. That's where the purpose of God is always being worked. That's why Jesus at one point, when the religious teachers, the Pharisees, Sadducees came against him for doing things on the Sabbath day. Jesus said, my father is always at work. Many would argue, well, thought it said that he rested. There are obviously different kinds of work. The purpose of God is now actively at work in our lives. How we engage with it, our perspective of that is of paramount importance. Part of the reason I want to share those things is because of the depth of what is here in the life of David and those things represented, I will not be able to touch on. We will touch on as much as we can. But those things were, even in David's own life, much happened in the inner man and what he was thinking about and the way that he did what he did and his perspective of things. So we're going to try and observe as much of that as we can within the context of what is pretty chaotic. You know, David had a... Man, some even up until this point, he's been, uh, he was a shepherd boy. That was probably the, the, the quietest, most peaceful time of his life. But as a young man, he was anointed to be king over Israel. And the spirit of the Lord came on him. And his, got, his life got, you know, very interesting at that point. As a shepherd boy, we know that there were beasts and animals that came against him to take his sheep, which we may say, well, that happens to all shepherds. Well, apparently it happened to David for a very different reason. There was a spiritual context there. And that is directly referred to when he sits before Saul, before he goes out to fight Goliath and says, You know, God did this, and here's why God did this. He allowed me to be prepared for it. So we can take that situation. I'm just giving some further example of what I've been recently talking about this last few moments. We could take that that and say, wow, look how God does things. He prepared David for Goliath by doing that, and that would be true. But there's even another context that doesn't directly correlate to the events in time. When he fought the bear and the lion, or when he fought Goliath, there was a spiritual representation there 
of the spirits that come against the flock of God, the people of God, and those who watch over and feed and lead and guide the flock. There are giants spiritually that are every bit as real as Goliath was in his flesh and bone, but they don't even have that kind of body. Yet they defy the purposes of God and the people of God. And they must be overcome. That transcends time. That, that can't be held in a timeline. It's another realm of influence. And it's still active now. It has an impact on our lives now. And it has a, it, there's a requirement for us to have an awareness of it now. Because God's purpose is active now, being fulfilled now needing our attention now, our engagement now. And that is how we must continue to not only be our own lives and spiritual walk, but also our reception, our receiving of the truth of Scripture. We're not, these are not history lessons. They are meant to not only teach you spiritual principle and, the, and, and reveal God's purposes through the scriptures, but enable you with such a perspective to receive and be taught by God for the fulfillment of his purpose in your life. Otherwise, we might as well just be going to any school and have anyone or any book or any author teach us whatever they please to teach us about this time of history, what happened, the context of it, the way of life of these people. That would be a history lesson. Maybe we would learn some good things. I want to encourage you guys. I spent way too much time of my life building up knowledge. I, that, that accounted for nothing. That bore little fruit in spiritual life. If any. To the point that God had to say, hey, you know, Tim, you know a lot about me, but you have no idea who I am. What a shame. Let's not learn about God. Let's learn who he is, what his purposes are, what his desires are. That is the, the essence of honoring and revering and making great the name of our God, the name. A name in this context is not a calling card. Hey, so-and-so. No, we will see here, and if you've read, then you'll see things that talk about invoking the name, calling upon the name. It's not a light action. It means something. It's not a token. It is an activation of a living reality and purpose and intention of a person, the person of God. It was the same here. It is meant to be the same in our own lives. With that, let's begin to go through 2 Samuel here. We are going to observe, go through the, the narrative, which is the historical happenings, making some, some observations.
Saul is now past. David has gone out to defeat the Amalekites. And an interesting thing happens. A man comes to Saul saying that he has escaped the battle. I mean, excuse me, a man comes to David saying that he has escaped the battle, that Saul and Jonathan were killed. So David requires a full account of how that happened, what happened. And this man makes up a story, clearly, because in the previous chapter, uh, 1 Samuel 31, uh, it, it says that his armor bearer was would not dare strike him down. And so, clearly, uh, verse 6 and 5 and 6 say, his armor bearer was terrified and would not do it when Saul asked him to kill him. And he didn't, but Saul fell on his own sword. Uh, his armor bearer observed that. And then when it, verse 5 says, when the armor bearer saw that Saul was dead, he too fell on his sword. So we have a pretty clear, detailed description of how Saul died. Now, there's an assumption that takes place several times in the first few chapters of 2 Samuel. And that is that Saul was the enemy of David, which in, in many ways would be seen as true, but it was never David's perspective of who Saul was. Saul, uh, David knew that Saul was against him and pursuing his life. He, however, always set Saul apart as the anointed of God. He had more than one opportunity to take Saul's life into his own hands. And not only did he not do it, he would not allow anyone else to do it under his uh, governance, under his control or leadership. He was very careful to honor and revere and respect the one who had been appointed by God as leader over Israel. So we have an assumption that takes place from man's perspective here of how, what something great or honorable to do would be for David. So this man comes, I did this honorable thing, Saul asked me to run him through, I did it, he's dead, bringing you the news. Interestingly and somewhat unfortunate for this guy, not only in his assumption of the story that he told, but the first verse here says, after the Saul, death of Saul, David returned from defeating who? The Amalekites. David, when this man comes, says, who are you? I'm an Amalekite. Wow, talk about wrong place, wrong time, wrong story, wrong assumption. David hears him out. Brings the crown. They begin to mourn for Saul. And then David says, where are you from? And he says this in verse 14. David asked him, why were you not afraid to lift your hand to destroy the Lord's anointed? the one who was appointed by God for this time. See, David was not a respecter of Saul himself. I mean, obviously he was pursued by Saul. He asked Saul many times, why are you treating me this way? David very much had a reverence, a fear, an honor. For God himself. For God's ways. 
the Lord's anointed, for God's timing, for God's oversight of anyone's life, whether they were for him or against him. We're going to see that on several occasions in David's life. So he honored God in all of it. So he has this, this young man. I don't know. I guess he was young. I'm not sure if he was not. But he strikes him down. Verse 16 says, For David had said to him, Your blood be on your own head. Your own mouth testified against you when you said, I killed the Lord's anointed. So chapter one finishes with a lament. We know that Jonathan and David were very close and there was a lament for both Saul and Jonathan. David is then anointed as king over Judah in Hebron, only that tribe. He reigns in Judah for seven years. And then he reigned in uh, Israel for 33 years after he was made king over Israel, which is coming up in the next couple of uh, chapters. Interestingly, Saul's son, Ishbosheth, is made to be king over Israel, which is a natural progression of leadership, you know, in a, in a nation that a king's son would take over from his father's rule unless usurped by another. So, uh, Abner uh, takes uh, Ishbosheth, whose name, by the way, means uh, man of shame. And he makes him king over Israel. We also see the beginning of some very uh, distinctive uh, hostilities between the house of David and the house of Saul. So it's very evident that while Saul pursued David, there were those that were for Saul and those that were against Saul, for David and against David, because of the enmity between the houses, because of Saul's pursuance of David. So we have this instance of uh, the war between the house of Saul and the house of David. They fight. We have this instance where uh, a, the younger brother of um, Joab, who was the, uh, the, the army commander on, of David's kingdom at this point, kills uh, Ahab's, or excuse me, Abner's... Um, Oh my goodness, I've got the names mixed up. Joab's younger brother, Azael. And so that became uh, a revenge point between them. They, they nearly destroy each other when um, Joab uh, and Abner speak and say, why are we killing each other? Are, are we not brothers in terms of our brotherhood as Israelites? And so Joab says in verse 28, blows the trumpet and all the men halted and they did no long, they no longer uh, pursued Israel. He said previous to that, as surely as God lives, if you had not spoken, the men would have continued to pursuit of their brothers until morning. And so there was a lot of loss of life there. Chapter three starts saying, uh, The war between the house of Saul and the house of David lasted a long time. So again, I'll refer to this. Was this a, were these real people that really fought each other? People really died? Yes. Was it the David and his leaders and his sons against those who were over the house of Saul and their leaders and their sons? Yes, it was. But there's something else representative here as well, spiritually, something that transcends time, goes beyond time, and that is what is described here as the house of David versus the house of, Hall, uh, of Saul. So there is a wisdom, a way of life, a way of relationship in, with, and unto the Lord that is represented by David and that is represented by Saul. In his house, 
So we're going to see several times throughout these next few chapters the mentioning of the house of. Sometimes, and we'll try to make this delineation, sometimes that directly refers to the physical descendants. Many times it refers to the entity of that house and not the flesh and bone. Although what was being lived out was lived out through flesh and bone. But there's a difference. There's a way of life, a wisdom, specifically in relation to the approach and understanding of God and his purposes. I want you to watch that develop in David's life. We've seen it described in Saul's life. In the Lord, that's the very reason that God tore the kingdom away from Saul. And gave it to one who would pursue the heart of God. That being David. So then there's a little bit of a rift in the camp of uh, Saul with Ishbosheth and Abner, where Ishbosheth uh, accuses Abner of uh, taking um, one of the, his father's concubines, and so Abner basically makes a covenant against um, Ishbosheth in three nine, saying, "May God deal with Abner, be it ever so severely, if I do not do for David what the Lord promised him on oath, and transfer the kingdom of the house of Saul, and establish David's throne over Israel and Judah from Dan to Beersheba." So that made Ishbosheth quiet down pretty quick. We then see that Joab takes revenge on Abner. So Abner brings over the kingdom of his, the, the, the rest of Israel to David. And then uh, uh, Joab uh, conspires and kills Abner in re, as a, uh, a revenge for um, uh, killing his younger brother. So latter, in the latter part of this chapter, this was not something that was planned by or approved by David. And we see David do something very intentional here. And there's basically a curse put on uh, Joab's house. This is verse 29 of chapter 3. 28 says, When David heard about this, he said, I and my kingdom are forever innocent before the Lord concerning the blood of Abner, son of Ner. May his blood fall upon the head of Joab and upon all his father's house. And may Joab's house never be without someone who has a running sore or leprosy or who leans on a crutch or who falls by the sword or who lacks food. And then he does a public mourning for Abner to show the people of Israel that he had no part to play in this vengeful death. So verse 36 says, all the people took note and were pleased. Indeed, everything the king did pleased them. So on that day, all the people in all Israel knew that the king had no part in the murder of Abner, son of Ner. Verse 38, the king said to his men, do you not realize that a prince and a great man has fallen in Israel this day? And today, though I am anointed king, I am weak. And these sons of Zariah are too strong for me. May the Lord repay the evildoer according to his evil deeds. So what are we seeing here? Not Again, not just historical events, not, wow, David's a good guy. What was, what was David really... What is, what's being represented here? What's, what can we see that's happening with David as a king? And that is that he is building a culture of honor, reverence, and respect. Things that very much characterize the house of God and the ways of God in the midst of his people with those who are set in a place of stewardship, guidance, leadership, authority, and the way they should handle things. 
This was seen by the people, observed by the leaders of the land, David was also humble. Not in these situations. He didn't try to do something for himself. He said, God will do it. So we see something similar happen in four again. Two uh, uh, of these men, Jonathan uh, had two men that were sons of Reman the Berethite from the tribe of Benjamin. They were leaders of some of the raiding bands in the in Saul's army. They come into Ishbosheth's house. They go into his bedroom. They murder him. They cut off his head. This was the son of Saul. And then they bring it to David. Look, we've done this great thing for you. It isn't Ishbosheth your enemy? Is it the house of Saul and David at war? Well, here we've done something great for you. This day, they say in verse 8, the Lord has avenged my Lord the king against Saul and his offspring. They have an idea of how God does things. Look, God has avenged you. This is David's response. David answered Rechab and his brother Bena, the sons of Rimon the Beerthite. As surely as the Lord lives, who has delivered me out of all trouble, who has done it? God has done it. When a man told me Saul is dead, he thought he was bringing me good news. And I seized him and put him to death in Ziklag. That was the reward I gave him for his news. How much more when wicked men have killed an innocent man in his own house on his own bed, should I not now demand his blood from your hand and rid the earth of you? So David gave an order to his men and they killed them. And they cut off their hands and feet and hung their bodies by the pool in Hebron, made a public display. And then they honored Ishbosheth's body. David was, again, making a public declaration of a new way. He was also honoring the covenant that he had made with the house of Saul through Jonathan to be kind to his descendants. So David is here not simply acting in, in integrity in the honor of his covenant to Jonathan, but there's another way, another wisdom being applied to the way of ruling the, the people of God. And he is clearly saying, You've got the wrong mindset. That's what he's communicating here in verse 10. That there was a man who said Saul is dead in thought. The way that he was thinking, his perspective of what he had done and what he was communicating was, hey, this is the right way. This is good news. And David said, but contrary to what he thought was the right way and good news, here was the reward for that way. What was it? Death. So we hear the echo of Proverbs saying, there is a way that seems right to man, but the end, in the end, it leads to death. There's a new way, a new order, a new mindset that's being conveyed here through David's life the way that he ruled, the perspective that he took, the honor that he gave to the things that God was working through and in. 
So we see in chapter 5, David is now made king over all Israel. Again, he had reigned in Judah seven years. And in Israel, over all of Israel, 33 years for a total of 40 years as a king. And then Jerusalem is taken. This is going to be the first mention in the scriptures of the fortress Zion. And that's there in the first couple of verse, or, uh, verses 6 through 7. It says the king and his men, this is Drew, uh, David, marched to Jerusalem to attack the Jebusites who had been in control over Jerusalem. And the Jebusites said to David, you will not get in here. Even the blind and the lame can ward you off. And they thought David can't get in here. Nevertheless, David captured the fortress of Zion, which he later called the city of David. Zion, the, the, the meaning of the name Zion, which I, I'm just going to describe it momentarily because Zion is used some, almost 200 times throughout the scriptures representative of the people of God, the house of God. The name itself, the word means signpost. That's something that is also uh, described throughout the scriptures, especially the prophetic scriptures. It also means the sunny mountain or mountain of sun. And it was said to be, uh, so the way that this looked on a geographical image Jerusalem and uh, the whole city of Jerusalem was uh, in a, a you know somewhat hilly mountainous area, and then you had uh, Zion, the city of David, was like another hill that was separated by a small rip valley between the rest of the city. Okay, so it was it was a fortress before David captured it. This was a it was a military fortress, which I think is very interesting to understand in the context of how Zion is used throughout the scriptures. It was also historically known to be Mount Moriah. And if you remember what Mount Moriah was, this was the place where God called Abraham to take Isaac to slay him. So this is where the proving of the covenant with Abraham was made and where God provided the ram in the place. Mount Moriah, the name Moriah means seen by Yahweh. So the progression of David's rule from Judah to the rest of Israel, now taking Jerusalem, there are some spiritual parallels to our own walk with God and to also the, the, the development of the house of God, the people of God, the church. I'm not going to go into all those details. I just want us to be mindful that there is a correlation between what we're seeing happening in the life of David, the development and the establishment of his kingdom, and the birth, development, maturing of we saw that in the life of Jesus. We will also see it in the life of the people of God, the church. So Jerusalem is taken from the Jebusites. We also see that David, because it's going to be referred to in this next chapter, David continues to defeat the Philistines. He goes down to fight them in the Valley of Giants, Rapha. And the Lord breaks out against them. And he defeats the Philistines. We see David in several instances here. Uh, we've seen it before. Now we see it again. That he inquires of God as to whether or not he should go and fight. So he. Uh, verse 18. Now the Philistines had come and spread out in the valley of Rephaim. The valley of giants. So David inquired of the Lord. Shall I go and attack the Philistines? Will you hand them over to me? He only will move at the Lord's command. Go, for I will surely hand the Philistines over to you. So David went to Baal Perazim. There he defeated them, and he said, As the waters break out, the Lord has broke out against my enemies before me. 
So that place was called Belperazim. Interestingly, he, they, the Philistines come up against him again. Again, verse 23, David inquired of the Lord, and the Lord said, don't do what you did before. Don't go straight up. Come around and wait for me. I thought that this has always been a, an intriguing thing. He, the Lord says, wait until you hear the marching of the Lord's army over the top of you. And then you will know that God himself, the, 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 the armies of God have gone out ahead of you when you hear that and you will know that you will overcome them. So he did that. Moving by the direction of God. Earlier in the chapter, we see that the king of Tyre sent building materials for David, These all this cedar and wood and things that were sent to him as a gift. And then he even had a, a beautiful palace built for David. So now David has decided in chapter 6 that he wants to bring the Ark of the Covenant back to Jerusalem, or to Jerusalem, excuse me. 6-2, he and all his men set out from Bela of Judah to bring up the ark of God, which is called by the name. The name of the Lord Almighty, who is enthroned between the cherubim that are on the ark. Now we know what happens. They're carrying the ark. They put it on a new cart. This is an interesting kind of progression that happens. Remember the ark had been captured by the Philistines, put in the temple Dagon. All these terrible things happen. The Philistines are like, okay, if we keep the ark, we're going to die. So they send it back. They don't even know how to treat this thing. They're afraid to touch it even. They're showing more reverence and honor and respect than even the Israelites have. And so they build a new cart and they send it. Remember when they did that? And they, you know, had these two oxen lead it that had young calves. And, you know, they would know that it would be a sign from God if they left their calves and took the cart where it was supposed to go anyway. So there was a lot of uh, a fear <laughs> that they had and wanting to understand, you know, who is this God? Is this real? And they saw, yes, it was. So that it was brought back uh uh, from the house of Abinadab. And then his sons are helping guide it. So they decided, well, we're going to move the ark again. Looks like we ought to, you know, do what the Philistines did. Okay. And uh, build a new cart. We're going to copy their ways to move the ark. Where the name of the Lord is represented where the presence of God is between the cherubim. And what happens? Well, Uzzah reaches out because the oxen stumble and it looks like the ark's going to fall off the cart and God strikes him down because he will not be moved. He will not be taken in an unprescribed way. God had given very careful instruction in the law to Moses on how the ark was to be handled. And guys, not just as a physical object overlaid with gold, with symbolic importance. You see, here we have another principle that transcends time. It wasn't about the box. It was about the way God does things. It's about how the things of God are to be handled. Not in another way. Not by the wisdom or the strength of man or the understanding of man. So here they are, says that Verse 5, they're worshiping and celebrating with all their might. Their souls are lifted high. But when they cross over the threshold of Nacon, the word Nacon means prepared. 
something that was firm and established. That's the name meaning. The oxen stumble. God set them up to expose the wrong way. And David realizes that. This is not the way of God. Not, as, not just this isn't what God prescribed in his law, but there was a deep cut that took place in David's life. And you can see it when he expresses this. And he says in verse 9, he was afraid of the Lord that day and said, how can the ark of God of the Lord ever come to me? Because I have misconstrued the ways, the purpose, the intention of God. among his people. We also see here that God doesn't play favorites. Not with David, who was a man after his own heart, who was developing a culture of honor and reverence. That does not negate the order, the way, the wisdom of God and its fulfillment. So then the ark stays for three months in the home of Obed-Edom. And he is blessed while the ark is there. Now we see a change happen in verse 13. Starting in 12. Now David was told the ark has blessed the household of Obed-Edom and everything that he has because of the ark of God. So David went down and brought up the ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom to the city of David with rejoicing. Verse 13. And those carrying the ark, who would that be? The priests. Those appointed by God to carry the ark and its contents. Every six steps, they sacrificed a bull and a fattened calf. And David was wearing a linen ephod. He set himself apart and danced before the Lord with all his might. While he and the entire house of Israel brought up the ark of the Lord with shouts and the sound of trumpets. And as the ark was entering the city of David, the daughter of Saul, Michael, despised David. For his, uh, unabashed worship. So when he is finished and he gives bread to all the people. He comes back into the house and Michael comes to him and says, how the king of Israel has distinguished himself today, being a little sarcastic, right? Disrobing in the sight of the slave girls of his servants as any vulgar fellow would. So David said to Michael, it was before the Lord who chose me rather than your father or anyone from his house when he appointed me ruler over the Lord's people. I wasn't doing this for any man, for any person. I was doing it for the Lord. That's why I celebrated before the Lord. And I will become even more undignified than this. And I will be humiliated in my own eyes. But these, even in my own eyes, I will be humiliated. But by these slave girls you spoke of, I will be held in honor. Now verse 23 says this. And Michael, the daughter of Saul, okay, from the household of Saul, who was allowed by Saul to be married to David to be a snare to him. So again, we have these two houses representative of two different wisdoms, two different perspectives of the things and the ways of God coming into play here. Verse 23, And Michael, the daughter of Saul, of the house of Saul, had no children to the day of her death.
So she despises David, representative, symbolic, messianic of Christ for the humiliation of fulfilling the heart of God among the people with the humility of Christ. And because of her disposition towards David, she despised his engagement of the ways of God. She was barren. I wonder why there is a barrenness in the midst of God's people in these days. Why has the church become barren? When we look at the principle of the womb throughout the scriptures, we see that the womb is either opened or closed by the word of God, the blessing of God, the purpose of God. So the opening or closing of the womb is very closely connected to the fulfillment of the purposes of God. Moving on into chapter 7, we'll, I didn't get quite as far as I would have liked to today, but we'll, I guess, finish here today with chapter 7. David begins to consider the dwelling place of the Lord. It's, I want you to think about how David thinks. He's a king over all Israel. Been through many battles. Had some pretty interesting things happen. Remember he was at the city living under a Philistine ruler and acted like a crazy man. Says he was drooling all over himself and clawing and scratching on the gate of the city. <laughs> a madman. Pursued, despised, rejected. Now vindicated by God, set as king by the promise of God, the anointing and the appointing of God. Other rulers in the areas come to build him a house, a palace, and here he sits in his cedar palace and it, he's struck in the heart. Verse two, he said to Nathan the prophet, here I am living in a palace of cedar while the ark of God remains in a tent. Nathan says, well, the Lord is with you. Do what's on your heart. And then he goes to bed that night and the Lord speaks to him. Go and tell my servant David, this is what the Lord says. Are you the one to build me a house to dwell in? I have not dwelt in a house from the day I, oh, here's that reference again, from the day I brought the Israelites up out of Egypt. I have been moving from place to place with a tent as my dwelling Wherever I have moved with all the Israelites, did I ever say to any of their rulers whom I commanded to shepherd my people Israel, why have you not built me a house of cedar? God's building on something here in his word to Nathan, which will be directly conveyed to David. But apparently he is pleased with the way that David is thinking. But he wants to make something clear. I will have a dwelling, but not that kind of dwelling. And also, I am greatly pleased with this concern of yours.
then I'm going to bless you for it because you want to build me a house. But he then says, let me reveal something to you about the true nature of my house. So he blesses David. And then in verse 11, he says some specific things previous to that about what he will do for David and his family. But in verse 11, he says something specific about this house that he will build. Again, I want to make the comparison between the house of Saul, the house of David. One may represent more directly their descendants, sons, daughters, etc. The lands that they had physically on earth. The other represents a spiritual way, a wisdom. This is this represents that in verse here in verse 11. The Lord declares to you that the Lord himself, who will do it? The Lord himself will establish a house for you, a way of kingship, a way of rulership. When your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring, your seed, to secede you who will come from your own body and I will establish his kingdom, which we know Jesus Christ was in the lineage of David from the tribe of Judah. He also did establish Solomon, one of David's sons as king who built the temple. So there was some direct fulfillment there. But the Lord says here in verse 13, he is the one who will build a house for my name. And I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. Sir, there is a specific type of throne ruling authority that God will establish. He goes further to say, I will be his father and he will be my son. Now we see this in the Psalms and in other prophetic writings that this was speaking of Jesus Christ himself and the sons of God. And not just Solomon himself who built the temple. I will be his father. He will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with the rod of men, with floggings inflicted by men. But my love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. Well, we can look at history today and see that the physical throne of David and his house does not have a place anywhere in the world right now. There's a spiritual kingdom, a spiritual house that is being referred to here, which is why this isn't just a historical happening. It's a living reality. The Lord would have a house built for his name where his order reigns, where his dwelling is, where his purposes are fulfilled. When he mentions your throne here, he's speaking of a ruling authority, a righteous and honorable rule, a model. There's a... There's a it, it's exemplary. It's a pattern. So David responds to the Lord beginning in verse 19. Who am I, or 18, who am I, O sovereign Lord, and what is my family that you have brought me this far? And as if that were not enough in your sight, O sovereign Lord, you have also spoken about the future of the house of your servant. So yes, David is thinking about his lineage, which would be accurate. But there's something more 
And he knows there is, and he considers this in the Psalms as well, but he says it here. Is this your usual way of dealing with man? Oh, sovereign Lord. See, David thinks about why God is doing what he is doing in the way that he's doing. He considers it deeply. So he begins to praise the Lord. Verse 22. How great you are. Uh, well, let's back up because this is worth reading. Verse 20. What more can David say to you? For you know your servant, O sovereign Lord, for the sake of your word and according to your will. The will of God matters to David. What's God doing? What's he about? What's his purpose? According to your will, you have done this great thing and made it known to your servant. See, there's a revelation that has taken place about the purposes of God. This isn't David just saying, you do all things according to your will. This, there's a certain amount of revelation and understanding on David's part about what the will of God is for his people. How great you are, verse 22. O sovereign Lord, there is none like you and there is no God but you, as we have heard with our own ears. Who is like your people, Israel? Now listen. This is a direct indicator that David is thinking about why God did what he did with his people from the very beginning. What was God trying to do? What's his purpose? Who is like your people Israel, the one nation on earth that God, you, went out to redeem as a people for himself and to make a name for himself and to perform great and awesome wonders by driving out nations and their gods from before your people, who you redeemed from Egypt. Man, what a packed sentence. All God's purpose revealed here. Not just the physical nations driven out, but the nations that we spoke of and the seven nations of the spirits that inflict the soul and the life of man so that the purpose of God cannot be fulfilled in their midst. David's seeing that. This is prophetic words, a prophetic praise to God over his purposes in the midst of mankind. Driving out all the ites from Egypt, rescuing, saving them from Egypt to make them a people for himself, to serve, to worship, to fulfill his purposes. You, verse 24, have established your people Israel as your very own forever. And you, O oh Lord, have become their God. I will be your God. You will be my people. And now, Lord God, keep forever the promise you have made concerning your servant and his house. Do as you promise so that your name will be great forever. What does that mean? That his name like a banner would be raised up and that all nations, all entities all the angels would know the purpose of God for eternity. The Lord Almighty is God over Israel. That's what men will say. And the house of your servant David will be established before you. O oh Lord Almighty God of Israel, you have revealed this to your servant saying, I will build a house for you. So your servant has found courage to offer you this prayer. A prophetic prayer of praise. O oh, sovereign Lord, your God, your words are trustworthy and you have promised these good things to your servant. Now be pleased to bless the house of your servant that it may continue forever in your sight for you, O oh, sovereign Lord, have spoken. And with your blessing, the house of your servant will be blessed forever. That is invoking, conferring even the promise to Abraham that there would be a people belonging to God for his purposes. 
See, these aren't historical events. This is the active work of God in the midst of his people. God's purpose hasn't changed. And he wants it to be fulfilled in us. And not just personally, but as a people, as a nation, as a family in him. We'll finish there today. Bless the Lord.